Thank you very much. Let me just bigify a little. All right, there you go. Hopefully you can see that. Um, great presentation, Miguel. Very, very hard act to follow. I'm uh, looking forward to looking into your, uh, your tool a bit more. It looks fantastic. Anyway, um, thanks for the time. Uh, we are Last Mile Exchange, um, and that's going to be where we begin. Who are we? Uh, well, that's me on the left. As you can see, I'm, I'm rocking a, a pretty good lockdown beard at the moment compared to my, my, my picture there. If you look me up on LinkedIn, you'll see the same picture, but uh, yeah, quite hard to recognize at the moment. Um, I'm the technical director and co-founder of Last Mile Exchange, along with James Grant, uh, who's also on this call. Uh, and we started Last Mile Exchange uh, in 2005, having worked together in, to get in telecoms for a number of years before that. Um, we both had a background in telecoms, in, in, in the pricing, network pricing arena. Um, having worked in the likes of Verizon and Colt and James worked in Telecom Italia uh, before that. So we have quite a deep and long background in that space. Um, in terms of the background, a bit more background and timeline and who we are, we're a SaaS company. We provide um, managed software as a service software to telecoms companies um, with a vertical focus there in telecoms uh, and, and particularly on access, which is also known as, as the last mile therefore our name last mile exchange and in fact um, we began as a company that had a product that was a reverse network auction platform thus the name the last mile exchange however in 2010 we pivoted to um, to what we call access network automation don't worry i am going to explain what access is in a little bit um, and over that time we've now grown to the point where a team of 25 uh, there are eight of us in the uk uh, 17 in romania mostly around customer support and software development. And we have built up uh, a reasonably decent um, customer base of, of pretty large telcos for a fairly small company. So some of those you will recognize, um, some of those even my, my, my mum and dad recognize, although some of them you may not recognize unless you're in the telecoms game. Um, so next slide. But of course, we present this quite a lot and a lot, a lot of times we get to the end of our first or second or third slide and a lot of people are saying you know okay that that's really nice Andrew but what is access so let's just take a really simple use case you've got a, a big multinational company like HSBC and they've got an office in New York office in Singapore and they want to connect those two buildings so they'll go to someone like a BT or a Vodafone or, or a Verizon and they'll say look can you please connect my two buildings BT will say look of course I can um, we've got a global network, um, but, but in fact, what they've got is that they don't necessarily connect up every building in the world. Sure, in the UK they might, but once you get to the US or once you get to Singapore, they are off net. Um, so what they need to do is they need to buy access, they need to buy last mile from local providers. So in effect, access is the connection between the POP, the point of presence, the hub location of, of, of the global carrier and, and the end customer. Um, an analogy we use quite often is, is that of, of, of airlines. So imagine BT, BT can fly you from Heathrow to, to JFK, but they may not get you to 60 Hudson. To that, you've got to jump on a train, or you've got to jump on a taxi, and that, that's effectively what access is. It's just a bit of the network that the big global carriers buy off other carriers to get them to where they want to be. So that's what access is, but why does it matter? And, and in fact, what does it have to do with, with GIS? Well, firstly, I mean, from a commercial point of view, access matters a lot because for every deal, the left, left panel here shows that the cost of access often ends up and usually ends up being around about 50% of the entire deal. So, so it might be BT with their label on the front that are selling this stuff, but 50% of the money they get paid from the customers goes straight out to their suppliers, um, which means that not only is getting the right cost in the first place good and the best costs really important um, because that's going to have a big impact on on whether you win the deal or not it also means um, if you do win it and you get it wrong your your margins take it take an absolute pounding so um, getting access right matters um, and, and then the, the geography comes into it so on the right hand panel here what you'll see is that access costs a lot vary a lot based on where you are and they can vary a lot based on very small differences. And this is, this is a real example, and you're gonna see Leona Strass, Leona Strass quite a bit in the next five minutes. Um, but for a 100 meg connection from a site in, in Frankfurt, in uh, Leona Strasser, back to the data center, uh, interconnect for a particular carrier, 
Uh, if you're at 22 Leona Strasser in this particular case, it would cost you around 3,600 euros a year to connect uh, back to that data center. If you're at 21, it will cost you 7,900. And so getting it right makes a big difference, makes a big difference to the commercials. And it can be you know, deal winning. So that's, that's why it matters to the telcos and that's, that's sort of why our business came about. We identified that getting access right matters. We, we thought we had a pretty good background in it and we thought we had some pretty good ideas about how we might go about doing that. We then sort of said, right, we know how to do this. We're gonna to go to these telcos and tell them, you know, what we're gonna build the software, we're gonna tell them how to do it. And we often find ourselves sitting in front of, you know, we, we get the, the business team excited, but ultimately we end up sitting in front of the IT teams and they begin with, with a process flow and go, right, this is, this is how we think access quoting gets worked out, you know, and it's usually a flow chart, somewhat more complicated than this, but not a lot. And it begins with this, this dreaded box called enter address. And uh, as, as if that's a singular thing that, that's pretty easy to do, they sort of say, right, we'll, we'll give you an address, you'll do some, some stuff, and then you'll give us back quotes, how hard can it be? Um, and, and that's, if it was that easy, we, we wouldn't have a business, we wouldn't have been doing this for 15 years, and we wouldn't have 25 of us running around helping these companies do it. Um, and, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir somewhat here in that you, you guys know how hard addresses can be. Um, and it's not only how hard can entering the address be, but effectively the problem we're solving is here I am, or here is my customer, who else is here and who can give me what I want. So when it comes to entering addresses, it doesn't take into account, that box doesn't really account for things like the user location or the language. Take 88, and these, these are all real examples, by the way, that I, I just sort of sat down and thought of things I've spoken to customers about probably within the last three months. Um, doesn't account for user location and language. So take 88 Queensway in Hong Kong. If you've gone to Hong Kong, it's a specific place, nice big shiny shopping centre, a lot of hotels above it. Um, one of the uh, address cleansing services we use, that we integrate for one of our customers, um, if you start typing that, what you see is the picture in front of you. So it, and, and this is once we have done everything we can in our integration to say, look, we only speak English, we'd like the answer back in English, please. And this is a pretty big service that, that probably should know better. Um, so you've got, obviously their data is localized, very localized, and uh, it's being presented back in a language that I don't speak. I speak French fairly poorly. I speak German even even worse, but I certainly don't speak Mandarin or Cantonese. So this this is just no good to me. So that's that's a difficulty we face. Um, secondly, poor input addresses. So we deal with telcos. Um, they go out to their customers and say, right, give us your addresses. Tell us what you want. We'll put them into our systems and we'll we'll give you a cost. Um, and a lot of times those customers, you would think they would know where their, their buildings are, but you're probably dealing with somebody in, in procurement. They're going to be based somewhere centrally. Global company, they're going to have, cust they're going to have offices often in, in places that they can't spell. So, you know, or in languages they don't speak. So you often get incredibly poor input addresses, even, you know, after it's gone through a few cycles of cleaning. And, and some examples from real things that we've had through our system in the last few weeks uh, are things that include things like opposite the Sheraton Hotel in Dubai um, or in Indonesia, for example, it's building names are what matters in Indonesia. So um, in this case, Bej was, was apparently all you needed to know exactly what this, this particular person was talking about. And he sort of said, what, you know, what is Bej? Apparently it's a building that relates to the, the, the um, Jakarta Stock Exchange, but everyone in Indonesia knows it. The problem is if you're building a platform or if you've got a business that is global, you can't rely on your um, salesperson in, in, in New York or in, in Stockholm to know what the local people in Indonesia do. And finally, you get local address peculiarities. Um, a lot of systems, a lot of GIS systems came from the US and they, they work on a, on a notion that you've got a building number, a street, a zip and a locality, which you know works, works very well in the US and, and works reasonably well in a lot of the world. But, you know, you don't have to go too far until you hit Tokyo where you've got Choban Go. And if, if, if you're a New York based account manager talking to a New York based customer that happens to have an office in Tokyo, it's very easy to have that address lost in translation between the customer 
to the carrier to the systems that are going to try and process that. So, so these are the things where you know enter address is it seems easy, but it's really hard. And that's the domain we operate in, and and, and they, these are the problems that we try to solve. Um, I think I'm jumping to a demo next. Okay, sorry, I've got one more point. Um, so yeah, and this is the point that we often make to our customers that, that cleaning addresses and managing addresses and geocoding it's it's a valuable tool in in this process and many others, but it's not magic. I mean, some great stuff has been done in this space in terms of, you know, parsing and, and, and interpreting um, natural language data, but, but still at some point it breaks down. Um, and yeah, that's where the, where the, where the problems lie. So uh, demo, as the slide says, a bit like um, Miguel said, sometimes I'm not used to speaking this much without showing the application. This is effectively our application and um, it's, it's, not as fancy, but uh, it does the job. So let's just take out our friendly address in Leona Strasse. So you've got an account manager, they've got a customer, um, says, right, we're in Leona Strasse. And, and this part of our application is the visual side. So the telcos can, can view their network, they put in the customer site, and what it does is it shows them the assets around. In this case, I've just got um, a KMZ in of, of, a, of an imaginary network. Um, and, and what this would tell the user is, you've got network out the front door, you know, you should really be considering using our own network. Um, we can also show, we can show anything on this to be honest, that can be held in the KMZ, we can show buildings, we can show uh, splicing points, manholes in the road, all these sorts of things that, that help the, the, the user make the decision. Um, and this may seem very easy and very obvious to all of us, but, but this sort of information isn't, wasn't, and still isn't widely available within organisations. And, and this particular tool you're seeing here grew out of, of a problem at one of our customers um, quite a few years ago now. Uh, they, they had a, a Finnish salesperson um, who was dealing with Nokia back when, when Nokia was, it was a much bigger company than it is now. And, and they, Nokia wanted to buy a 10 gigabit um, connection in Bristol in the west of, of the UK. Um, 10 gig is still a reasonably large amount, but this was quite a few years ago. So we're talking, you know, we're talking like a hundred gig type, type speeds now. So it was a really big deal. This Finnish account manager, oh, well, I'm gonna make the story up here for the sake of a good story, but you know, I'm imagining that they probably looked at the map and went, well, you know, where's Bristol? It, it's all the way over there. That's, that's quite a long way from London. I'm gonna guess that there's no network over there. So what ended up happening was, was this really large circuit just went, they went straight to BT to order it. Um, they paid BT a very, very large sum of money over, over the contract term of, of, of that, uh, that circuit. Um, but at some point someone looked at this and went, and actually funnily enough, they looked at it on, on this tool and they went, we've actually got fibre running down the middle of the street out the front of this building. Um, what had happened is you had data opacity, the, the, the user in Finland just didn't have access to the information they needed to make the right decisions. Um, and that ended up costing, costing this particular um, customer a whole lot of money um, and fortunately for us it led to the introduction of this tool and, and and you know that was that was where we started and so this is the very visual side of it that we're all very familiar with however there is another side to the access problem as well because not all data is available and freely shared in the market um, companies in the US are very free giving out KMZ files giving out the lit buildings but in, in Europe less so, in Asia very much less so. Um, in some cases, this is considered to be sort of highly secure, highly security conscious data. So they don't just, just hand it out. Um, so if you wanna know who is available to provide a service here, we, we have another flow, which is effectively what we call the off-net quoting process. And you come in here, you've got your address and you say what you want. So this particular case, um, it's a demo case, but somebody wants a 10 meg service and they effectively press get quote. What our system does is it sort of throws it out to the, well, through, through one of the two paths. Um, we hold a lot of data internally. We, we, we collated through our partners um, millions and millions of data points of, of connected network buildings. Um, from suppliers. Um, however, they provide that to us. We don't have a lot of control over that. The quality is a little bit bit messy, um, but we have those four and a half million data points. We also have geographic information that, that, that defines where other carriers are available and where they can provide um, provide coverage as well. Um, and we, we, we call those internal data sources that we hold. We also call external data sources via API. Um, APIs are, are pretty universal in the travel market. 
everyone's used to going to Skyscanner and typing it in and it calls out to all the airlines. Telco for, for a tech industry is still a little bit behind. Um, and we have 50 to 60 odd suppliers that we connect to for APIs. We probably have in the hundreds of suppliers that still provide us data in, in CSV, Excel, whatever. So we take our address, we, um, we flagged up buildings that might be in the area, the user chooses these. Um, you can see it's narrowed it down to a, a list of selections and they choose them and then, then they press continue. And then, then effectively it does a bit of, bit of crunching behind the scenes and eventually it should bring back a, a, a list of all the options that are available off net off the, the, the customer's uh, network in this location. If I speak a little bit more slowly, um, it should come up any moment now. There you go. So you end up with something like this. It's, it's Skyscanner-esque. It, it says, these are the carriers. This is all made up data. So if any of you uh, are familiar with the German market and go, I'm really not sure Schmidt AG is a, is, is a real, real carrier in Germany. That's because it's not. But it presents the data like this um, and, and our, our customers can see you know, what the costs are, what the installs are, what the monthly charges are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's the problem space that we're operating in. And, and hopefully that looked pretty easy. Um, that's actually a problem we often face when, when facing these self-same IT people where they go, well, well, how hard can it be? Because you just enter an address, do some magic and, and then, then get an address out. But if I jump back to my slides, and give you an example of, of what's just gone on here. It's a bit, bit easier if you look at it like this. And, and we go through the flow. So effectively, we, we triggered a search. And firstly, we, we, we looked at our internal options um, and the geographic factors came into play here. So I mentioned we've got a carrier building database, four and a half million buildings, depending on, on our customer. Um, we also have other geographic identifiers. It can be postcode, it can be phone area, it can be distance from, from, um, from uh, from data centers. Um, we have all these things that, that come into play that we assess against the search address, trying to be honest, Strata. But the buildings is probably the most important thing. And um, so we have to match our, our input address against this reference data. And I'm simplifying a bit, but, but effectively we've got some algorithms um, based around, uh, I mean, the, the Levenstein distance edit, for example, something many of you may be familiar with. We effectively compare strings and say, how, how similar are these addresses? Um, and, and you end up with something like this. So all of these addresses are utterly valid ways of presenting 20 Leonestrasse in Germany. All of them will be uh, recognized by, by German, national German speakers. Um, the way that you can present the thoroughfare ending uh, are all legitimate um, things like the, the S set, the double S, uh, things like that. And, and, and you see things like carrier A, Leonestrasse, that's, a 73% match um, using a, a distance edit. Um, but it's actually correct. You've then got uh, Leona Strasser with the S set, 87% match. You've got number 10 Leona Strasser, spelt exactly the same way with a 93% match, um, but it's wrong. However, because you've only got to change one character to get that, that match. Um, and then you've got 20 Leona Strasser, which is thoroughly wrong and, and it is sort of down at, at 80%. But interestingly, still more accurate than, than the first one that is correct. And, and this is the space that, 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 you know, a greatly simplified version, but this is a space we operate. Now, we're ultimately a telco software company that, that dabbles in GIS. We're, we're not a GIS company as, as such, and, and we're not seeking if we can help it to solve the deep and dark problems of, of the address world. Ideally, we want to use open source libraries, you know, look at problems that are being solved, apply them to our problems, use third party application, third party APIs. And, and that's what we do largely. Um, but still, this hopefully, rep hopefully represents an example, a fairly trivialized example of, of the face, the problem that we face. We can and, and, and we, we look at, you know, you might look at this and say, why not just, uh, you look, you just take off the, the thoroughfare ending and you get rid of the the street numbers and you just match on that and, and the job's easy um, but you know as I said this is quite trivialized and um, funny enough I was talking to James before this about exactly doing that dropping Strasser off the end and matching it which reminded me of an example in real life that I had um, funnily enough I used to live at 174 Hammersmith Road a uh, Grove sorry in W6 London um, and, and by coincidence my office was on uh, 
Hammersmith Road W6. And um, one of our customers' systems made the assumption that if your house number and your street precursor and your uh, UK post zone outbound postcode was the same, then obviously that was a match. So I used to actually get map email, uh, post sent to me at home being delivered to me at my office. So that's kind of what happens. We've taken a slightly easy path here. We, we just don't try and solve a 100% match here. We kind of pass it over to the meatware, to the humans who, who look at that, distill it down. And humans are very good at parsing um, data like this. They'll look down there and go, look, carrier A, carrier B, I'm good, I'm gonna pick them and I've got results. Um, and, and that's the happy day path. But, but then you get the external APIs where we just pass this address in and we really have no visibility of what algorithms or what they do. So you know, magic happens there sometimes and they pass us the results, but we have no visibility of that. And we're a bit dependent on how good a job they do. Um, at the bottom here, this is a, again, a very real example that, that actually only came up last week where we had, uh, it wasn't 20 Leonistrasse, but it was very similar and it was in Germany. Um, we were searching for 20 Leona Strasse. We knew this carrier had fibre into this building, but we were getting a negative response back. Eventually, we, we contacted them directly and said, Look, this is what we're sending to your API. This is what you're sending back. What's going on? They dug around for a while, and, and basically, it turned out their database had 20 to 22 Leona Strasse. Um, and therefore, they said that was not the same. A pretty trivial example, but with real wor world implications. Um, so we're not the only ones looking to solve what would otherwise seem to be pretty trivial problems. So, you know, I've spoken about the challenge we face, but if I was to digest them down and with a pretty picture and a few bullet points, I'd say that we face challenges with poor input data. Uh, it can be very poor, it can be very variable or variable, as I've written there. Um, the reference data, it's heterogeneous. We don't control where it comes from. We, there are, well, quite literally thousands of suppliers that, that have fiber networks globally, or well, not even fiber, um, you know, 3G, 4G, 5G, increasingly microwave, uh, satellite. And some of these addresses are, we get addresses for, for wind turbines, we get them for, for oil, um, oil fields. Um, and those data can be, those, those addresses can be incredibly non-standard and uh, matching them can be very, very challenging. Uh, our problem domain is global. Uh, I've often, when speaking to carriers that operate only in the UK, you know, jokingly said, I, I really, I really, really envy you. you. You've really only got to build a system that, that works in the UK and that's, or, or in the US, and that's hard enough. Um, when you're trying to deal with the issues that I've already mentioned, such as languages, address systems, Choban, Go versus you know, house number and building, problems really arise. And, and then you get to the world of geocoding and, and cleansing. Um, we, we began our life using Google, and, and Google, Google is great. Uh, you know, say what you think about them, but it really is, is kind of preeminent there. Um, they, but they have a few problems. They've changed their licensing recently, uh, in the last year or two, and that's, that's changed the game somewhat. Um, also, it's, it's not authoritative. People often think it is. Uh, the, the amount of times that I have to, to, to explain to people that just because Google says that's the address doesn't mean that's the address is, um, well, anyway, it's a lot. And quite often the services that we deliver end up having to be delivered somewhere. So it's not just a quoting, it ends up, you know, someone turns up and wants to plug something in. So you need to get the address right. So you, you have to often refer back to authoritative authorities, um, which raises the question, well, what do you use if you're not using Google to geocode or cleanse? Well, um, I mean, we use Locate, as one vendor, we've, we've, we've reviewed quite a few. It's, it's pretty good. Um, not so great in, in, in China, but they're, they're promising me that they're going to improve. We also use OpenCage. OpenCage is great as well. Um, we, we, we get a lot out of that. Um, and, and we continue to look at options because this is, is a space that, that is evolving and is evolving a lot. Um, and then you get country-specific challenges. Um, China and India. I've mentioned it in passing, but, but address cleansing in China is is challenging to say the least, but changing very rapidly. Um, um, and same as India as well. Anyone who's only ever worked in with addresses in, in the UK or, or the US or, um, or the Netherlands, for example, um, India is, is, is a completely different world. And, and we've spoken to the carriers in India who have 
you know, basically said, yeah, even we don't really know how to, to manage addresses and, and how to manage this problem space. But those are the challenges that we're facing that we're continuing to build on with um, in the space we're operating. Um, well, I mean, how do you solve a problem like addresses? Well, what we've shown you some of the things that we're already doing, um, some fairly macro things uh, around trying to control the inputs, but, but actually as our business grows, a lot of our systems, a lot of our customers are no longer using our front end. So, so they, they don't have that nice type ahead thing where we can control what they input. They integrate with us with APIs. So they've got their own address entry system, which sometimes is no address entry system at, at all. So it's not an interactive process. The user just types in what they want and throws it over the fence. Um, but we are continuing to work on this uh, through a number of means. Um, we're looking at the algorithms and tech uh, effectively and looking at, you know, with limited control, how can we improve matching? So we continue to, well, we are continuing to build country specific algorithms to address the issues that we, we mentioned uh, like Germany. So we, whilst we try to avoid it, and I said, we, if we can help, we don't, um, we, we are doing customizations around that, which, which involves us having to understand country by country address structures. Fortunately, we, we collect a lot of data doing what we do. We collect millions and millions of address data points that matter to the telecoms community every year. Um, so we can analyze that and, and, and look for trends that we can apply. Um, there are some technical solutions out there that we can leverage, hopefully reasonably wholesale. Um, a lot of natural language processing work has been done um, for string matching uh, and deduplication. So there's some interesting things going on there that we are investigating all as well, uh, hoping that we can maybe get some benefits from that. Um, improved geocoding at the front end. So, so the first one is, is, is dealing with once you've got an address and once you're trying to match it, you know, what can you do? But, but also up front, hopefully we can also deal with collecting the address and geocoding those and, and we continue to explore commercially available services um, third-party providers looking at them as they evolve looking at them as they continue to to do a better job um, and also looking at open source so um, again i'll shout out to open cage um, but also things like the peleus geocoder that, that spun out of map zen um, we, we aren't doing that anything with that yet but we are considering whether we will um, considering creating a a customer specific um, uh, database or service for um, high value telecoms buildings data centers and the like um, which can be can be used um, and then we're looking at commercial options so uh, in the past as a smaller company we didn't have a lot of clout but as we we add um, bigger and bigger customers like the Vodafones and the BTs to our roster um, we we have more ability to go to the suppliers and say look you're sending us a spreadsheet that, that looked like it was sort of done by a by a dog and a drunk working on a late on a Friday night. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's something we can do here. Perhaps we can work with you to standardize the way that you manage your addresses. Um, and then on the customer data side as well, we, we continue to push out to our customers and their customers to try and help that both, both just through advisory and also um, with the way that they engage with the things that we've mentioned up here as well about how they can improve their matching, how they can potentially improve their algorithms and how they can use um, the services that are available out there too. Uh, clean up what they hand us and nothing would be complete without a Venn diagram. So effectively, those are the three things that we're, we're looking at. Um, we can improve any of these individually and, and we have in the past, but be it the upfront customer address, uh, the reference data that we have or the algorithms and tech that we use to, to do them. And, and, and we have, have worked at each of those interfaces um, and you do get benefits, but, but the magic will come when we can bring all three of those together and um, you know, clean up the input, clean up the reference, and and apply some of the interesting tech that's evolving in this space to to really try and get as close as we can to 100% automation of this address matching problem. And that is it. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, Stephen, we have we have time for a question or two. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions. Um, so, go. You're just taking me back. To my where on earth days, Andrew. Um, you know what? We, could, could I say, just say a, a shout out to where on earth? I mean, the day that I discovered where on earth in about two thousand and one was it was a, was a revelation. That was a, that, that was before its time. I, I love that yeah. service. Yeah. So um, a question um, come in here, which is really asking, which end of the chain is paying you? 
Is it the, um, the guy who owns the big pipe across the ocean, or is it the people who own the last mile of fibre? At the moment, our commercial model is, is, is what we call the buyers. So yeah, so it's, it's, the, it's the people that are buying access, you know, and some of the, well, there's a few things we say, even a small telco is generally a reasonably large company, um, but, but even some of the small telcos still need access. But generally speaking, we are paid by the buyers, um, the Vodafones, the BTs, the, the Telstras, the Telias. Um, that said, we are not ignorant of the fact that there is, you know, scope to explore the sell side as well. Right, okay. And I've got one more for you here, which is, um, no, I think you've answered that. It was, um, it was a geocoding question. I think you've answered it really well. Um, it seems amazing to me that uh, here we are, sort of 25 plus years after we started trying to produce global geocoding and we still haven't cracked it and the problems are still the same problems basically uh, it, largely still, it largely still revolves around people who live in western europe and the united states thinking that addresses are formatted in that way all the way around the world and of course they're not absolutely okay.